Well, hey everyone, welcome to FBC Rankin Online. My name is Micah, and I'm so glad that you chose to join us today for our online content. Uh, if you enjoy anything that you see here, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, so we can keep you up to date on whenever we release new stuff. And make sure to follow us on all of our social media outlets, be that uh, Instagram or Facebook, so you can stay up to date with what's going on here. And uh, I really hope you enjoy today's content. The dark tried to hide you and steal you away Death tried to keep you inside of the grave The enemy fought you, he tried but he lost cannot be stopped when we cried for freedom you tore down the walls the weight of our burdens you carried it all our fears and Failures hang dead on the cross. You cannot be stopped. Mover of mountains, breaker of chains, Jesus has tried. Stop, you cannot be stopped There's 
Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in When death was arrested and my life began And ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began And oh, your grace so free Washes over me You have made me new Now life begins with you and it's your I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He cancelled my debt And he called me his friend When death was arrested And my life began Oh, your grace so free Wash his soul week we always like to just say thank you to all of you who financially give uh, through our local church here and remind you that when you do just that, that some of that goes to many different causes and, and places around the world. 
One of those right now, if you've been following the news, you've been following the events playing themselves out in India. And you know what COVID's doing over there and all the repercussions linked to it. And so I'd like you to know that when you give money through our local church, some of that money right now is going over to India to help some of our sin relief partners, uh, giving them masks, distributing food, and just helping people understand and learn the truths about COVID and vaccination and all the things that go with it. So not only are we helping people hear the good news about Christ, we're meeting them at a tangible need and a very difficult place so that they might understand in a powerful way, hey, we're not just here to help you. We'd like to introduce you to the, to the God of the universe who'd love to love you, not just for a lifetime, but for eternity. So we invite you to be prayerful about what level of participation you might uh, be a part of in giving through our local church. Again, knowing it's not about numbers, it's not about budget, it's about people's lives being impacted with every dollar you give. Father, thank you that we have the privilege of helping out the people in India in a very, very difficult time, of helping them with real tangible needs of food and masks and things like that, helping them be educated about COVID and showing them the incredible love of Jesus, your son. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Look around. This world is not as it ought to be. Division, disease, discrimination, things are not okay. But this is not how it was intended, and God was not okay with it. He had to make a way back from darkness to light, from death to life. So he dropped a man into this atmosphere like an explosion of hope and like a billion fireworks lighting up the darkest night, he revealed the better way, the best way, the only way to truly live. He came to revive a dying world and divided cultures, to revive despairing hearts and desperate lives, to revive us all. Things are not okay. We need revival. Hey, we're so glad that you're joining us today as we continue in our series called Revive. Uh, I'd like to begin uh, today by asking you a question. Have you ever heard of the term genericization? I'm sure you have. If you haven't heard of the actual term itself, um, you probably asked someone, uh, could you pass me a Kleenex? You have a Band-Aid I could borrow. Is that your jacuzzi? Uh, you ever use roller blades? Um, do you have some bubble wrap I might could borrow? Um, things like that are actual items where the name brand has become what the item has been become known as being. So in other words, you don't ask for a tissue anymore. You actually ask for a Kleenex. You don't ask for a bandage. You ask for a Band-Aid. Um, you don't ask for, you know, a pop. You ask for a popsicle. And all these are at one time were the brand name, but they're actually now known what, as the actual object itself. And the reason I bring that to your attention is, as we've been talking together about revive, we've seen that God's invitation to us for revival, to, to experience all the things that we see in the bumper, uh, is, is love. Uh, loving God more and loving people more as well. And, and that term is much like these other terms that we referred to, Kleenex and Jello and Jacuzzi and rollerblades and things like that, where there are these items that... The, 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 def, the actual word itself has morphed into something it was never meant to be. And the same thing's true for love. And what I'd like us to see this week and next week, this week is a description of love. How does God describe love? And then next week, how does God define love? Because the odds are high for you and for me. We might tell someone we love them. We might feel love for someone. Someone might mention they love us. And at the same time, what that is really isn't true or it falls short or it frustrates us, mainly because we just don't know what real love is. For example, you might answer wrestle with this question. Can a person love Jesus? Can they sing a, a song with hands held high? Can they 
uh, have a t-shirt that says that? Can they affirm a message? Or maybe sitting in a small group say to someone, yes, I truly do love Jesus. And at the same time, feel comfortable in disobeying or not living out the, the, the challenges and the truths and the commands that Jesus gives. Well, in John chapter 14, verse 23, Jesus would say this, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. That for Jesus to define or to describe love meant an act of obedience. It's not just something we feel or something we affirm or an expression of our worship or a t-shirt we wear. It actually is a moment when we obey uh, the teaching that he gives. So, like I said, each week or this week and next week, we're going to look today, first of all, at two descriptions and attention. And we'll see that more in just a moment. And then next weekend, we're going to look at the definitions. How does God, how did God define love as him being the ultimate designer of all of life that we know? So um, we can put it this way. Here are the two descriptions we're going to look at today in the tension. And the two descriptions you'll find in, with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And the tension is there as well. And so I'd like to begin by looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1, 2, and 3. And as we look at this together, we, we find Paul telling us um, something unique and the, about the power and the need to understand what real love is. So as we look at it, Paul says, you know, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels and I don't have love, he posed that, that idea to us. I'm like a resounding gong or a cymbal. He goes on to say, I, I might have the gift of prophecy and fathom all the, the deep teachings of God and, and the knowledge. And if I have faith, it can move mountains, but no love. And he just goes ahead and says, there's nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and willing to sacrifice my body to hardship that I may boast and have no love, Paul again says, really, there's nothing. In other words, you and I might be great Bible teachers. We might understand God's word at a deep level. We might uh, display faith. I mean, we might, people might think, wow, this person has great faith in what they do. That we might live a sacrificial life. But Paul says, if the motivation for what we're doing is not love, nothing happens at all. Let me ask you, we're in spring. Let's say you have a house and uh, maybe a new home or you're fixing up your current home and you scrape the front yard and it's beautifully, just dirt looks perfect. You put seed down, you rake it, uh, you water it, fertilize it, nutrients, you put all the stuff on it and, and you just take care of it, take care of it, and take care of it. And no grass, no lawn ever comes up. But you might say, but I've been very busy. I've been doing all the right things. I, I've, been, I've been, you know, doing all this stuff. But if there's no lawn, it's nothing. And that's what Paul wants us to understand. Many times we get really busy doing church stuff and religious stuff and stuff that we think is important to God. But if love is missing, what Paul's communicating is if love is missing, nothing's happening. And all through the book of 1 Corinthians, this letter, Paul communicates this to them again and again and again. Here was a church, an affluent church, a church that appeared to be thriving from the outside. And yet, as we look at it, love was such a, an element that was missing. Let's look at a couple of examples. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 21, Paul challenged them because they were boasting in their human leaders. Look at our pastor. He's a, he's a rock star guy. Look at the, the person who's here who's doing the teaching and the leading and all this going on. And this is an amazing guy. And again, uh, love truly missing there. Paul talks to them about um, a time when, uh, we'll look at this more in a moment, where there's a guy doing something that was totally shocking the lost world. I mean, unbelieving people were like, what is going on with this guy and the sin that he's doing? And this church thought they were loving the guy by being permissive with it and saying, well, we love him and we don't want to offend him. We don't want to judge him for what he's doing. And Paul said, that's not, that's not love at all. We go on and we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 about a topic of food sacrifice to idols. And Paul says, to all of them, okay? Your knowledge is puffing you up. That's, you're, you're arrogant. Love left you a long time ago. You really don't care about other people. You're just totally focused on what you know and what you feel you can take and live out. 
and you're imposing on others and offending them in great ways. We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul's talking to them about, man, they're just going crazy in communion or the Lord's Supper. At that moment, some were withholding food from some. Others were getting intoxicated at, at this experience in this moment. And it was just chaotic because they had lost sight of what it was about. A time of showing great faith and admiration for the Lord, both a love of Him and a love of the believers that were there. And we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and there was an attitude in this church. So listen, I don't need you. I've got it covered. I, I, I can take care of everything that needs to happen. You just do your thing. I, I don't need you at all. And, and again, simple as it might sound, the concept love was missing. So love was an issue in the church we're going to look at today, the church at Corinth, at all levels. They were active. They were busy. They were doing all kinds of things. And yet love was nowhere to be found, nowhere to be seen. Or it had become something for them that God had never meant it to be. So let's look first of all at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 and 7, and discover the first trait, the first description that we like to see. Paul tells them, and I want to emphasize something to you that really the better way to re read this is not that love is patient, but that love practices patient and love practices protection and practices trust. It's a, it's a verbal idea, something that love is something that you do. It's not just something you feel. It practices hope, practices perseverance, and above all things, as it says there, love never fails. That love is something that we can understand that love is durable. And that's the first trait. It is, it is something that is persevering. And the reason we have to understand that is here's something we eat all, we all think intuitively know, but we really don't like to live out. And it's this truth right here that you really can never love without the possibility of hurt and pain. That love is linked to that. That when we love other people, we run the risk of having this experience and the odds are high we will be hurt, we will struggle, we will have difficulty because of our love relationship with this person. In fact, we see that Romans chapter 5 verse 8, that God has demonstrated His own love for us in this. While we were sinners, Christ didn't just come, He didn't just teach, He didn't just work miracles, He didn't just walk on water, He died. He died on the cross for us. And again, we see the link between love and hurt and pain. That love was demonstrated in a very powerfully hurting and painful experience as Jesus died on the cross. Now, as you're thinking about love right now, here's some things you have to ponder. So if you're going to enter into a dating relationship with someone and love them and expect them to love you back, then Paul would challenge you and say, the odds are you're running the risk of hurt and pain. If you're contemplating taking a ring and sliding it on, sliding it on someone's finger and inviting them to marry you and, 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 and be committed till death do you part. Again, you're inviting someone to step into your life and you're stepping to theirs where again, there will be hurt and there will be pain. Maybe you're contemplating and hoping and praying and wishing and wanting to bring a child into the world. And again, what a love experience, an amazing moment to hold a child, whether through adoption or a newborn child, whatever the case might be. And in those situations, when, adopt, when, when inviting a new child into our life, again, we run the risk of hurt and we run the risk of pain. You love your parents. You love your grandparents. And you enjoy love relationships with them, but the odds are high there's going to be hurt and pain with them, maybe by disease or death or something else that might take place. So before you, you love someone, you have to ask yourself this question. It's quite a humiliating, humbling thing to think about. As I love them and invite them to love me, am I willing to embrace the hurt and the pain? So in families, in friendships, at churches, in groups of people, in work groups, wherever we are in, in relationships of different types of love with one another, we invite hurt and pain. And even in the area of unbelieving people, you know, the Bible challenges us to love unbelieving people and to share our faith with them and, and to tell them the good news. Again, we have to understand in doing that, there'll be disappointment, there'll be hurt, there'll be pain. So, so again, that, that first description there is durability. 
and understanding that, that love must be tough. It must be a durable thing. And then the second part, or the second description I'd like us to see in verses 4 and 5. And there Paul gives another part to the list of not practicing envy, not boasting, not being proud, not dishonoring others, uh, not self-seeking, not easily angered, and keeping no record of wrongs. And so Paul gives another list to help us understand um, about love and another descriptive word that we can know. And it goes this way, that you and I can never really love if all we care about is us. Really care about us doing whatever we want to get do to get whatever we want to get. That that's not love. That might be what we're about, and that might be neediness, or might be codependency, or something like that. But that's not love. Love requires something uh, more significant. And the second word I like to give you is the word humility. The first word was durability. The second word is humility, and understanding that we have to have a sensitivity to other people. In fact, Jesus puts it this way, greater love has no man than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. That, that, that true love is not about me. It's about me willing to sacrifice for the sake of another. That if I have a child, if I have a spouse, if I have a friend, if I have a, a coworker, if I have a, a family member, that sometimes sacrificing what is rightfully mine for the sake of them is true revelation of love. And so I have to keep in mind whether it's friendship, whether it's dating, whether it's engagement, whether it's marriage, whether it's being with parents or with kids or grandparents or great grandparents or whomever the people might be at the local church, that if I'm going to love, humility is the key. That, that the moment I enter into a relationship with someone, I now share my life with them. I now share my possessions with them. I now share... Uh, my time with them. I now share everything that I have with them because again, the goal of a love relationship is not just about me getting my way, but me practicing something with the other person, me helping them to, to experience God, me helping them to be built up and encouraged and challenged along the way to become all that God has designed and created them, them to be. And with regards to unbelieving people, that I might have to willingly sacrifice and give up something that I enjoy, that I want, so that I might impact the life of another. Because again, love is about humility. It's about not looking out for my own interests. It's not about, you know, just making sure I'm okay. It's about saying, God, I trust you with that, and I am going to focus on the other person. I'm going to focus on impacting the life of another. In fact, we go now to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 and 6. And we've seen durability as a trait, and we've seen humility as a trait. But the, the, the next part is attention. I'd really like us to, to, to look at together. And the tension is, is here. Love practices kindness. And then it says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And so there's a, a tension I'd like us to, to understand that love practices kindness and rejoices in truth. And there'll always be a tension that exists between those two. Sometimes in your relationships of love, you'll go more towards the kindness. And other times in your relationship with love, you'll go more towards truth. But it's always going back and forth towards one or the other. And managing relationships helps us understand as God leads us, are we going to be leaning more towards relationships I mean, more towards truth, or we're leaning more uh, towards, towards the kindness part. And, and in the middle is like a, the perfect tension. And I don't mean directly in the middle, but as we're sensing the tension in a relationship, going back and forth between kindness and truth. And, and it's like a, an instrument, like a musical instrument that you play. And we understand that if you have a piano or a guitar or a violin, uh, the appropriate tension on the string or the cord, the appropriate tension allows a beautiful sound to come off. Uh, you know, as you, as you play it or you play it or whatever you do, a beautiful in, uh, sound comes off because of the tension of the string. And the same thing through relationships, that the beautiful harmony, we can say it that way, of love comes out of relationships when that tension is embraced where it needs to be. Whether it's in the middle, more towards kindness, 
or more towards truth, depending totally upon who we're talking about. Now, before we go any further, we need to really define each, each parameter, each side. So what do we mean by truth? Truth is reality. Truth is reality. And this is important because you'll find a lot of relationships have no truth. They're in fantasy or in some type of, uh, you know, maybe one day perspective. But a lot of relationships have no truth at all. There's no reality. There's, there's no element of what's really happening. It's what we hope, what we want, what we think, what we fantasize about, but not what's really taking place at all. So uh, that is incredibly significant. The other end, excuse me, let me go back. The other end is the kindness part, where, where something is pleasant, something is good. It's, it's life-giving. It's refreshing. It's something that does impact a person's life. And so we can understand the, the tension that exists between the two. Um, and something can be of God, from God, because God is a good God. And so it comes from Him. It's kind. So let's look, for example, at two situations in the city, church at Corinth that, that Paul wrote about where they embraced this tension or Paul challenged him to embrace this tension between kindness and between truth. The first one here is something uh, where we've looked at these at the beginning, but we're coming back for a little bit of a deeper look. Paul tells them, he says, listen, we know something about food and, and here's the truth. Here's reality. Okay. Food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we eat or better if we do. Paul says, here is something, here's reality. Now, not everyone will agree with this, but Paul would say, here's how God sees it. Here's how God created it. That food itself doesn't bring us to God or keep us from God. There's nothing wrong with eating anything. Paul says, we're, not, not, we're no worse off or better if we eat it. That is reality. But at the same time, he brings the kindness part. Here's a part from a good God. Here's the refreshing part, the loving part, the life-giving part. Paul says this, but be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom to eat the food we've been talking about, your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak, to the people who are a little more legalistic in their belief, new in their faith, and, and just a little more rules-oriented. So Paul said, here's the truth. The truth is this, okay? Food, nothing wrong with it. But, but the other part, he says, the kindness part is be sensitive to the other person. That food, you understand there's nothing wrong with it, but you don't eat the food that might offend them because you care about them. That comes from a good God. So there's an example of maybe the answer was like directly in the middle. Some truth and some kindness, and the answer was in the middle. But let's look at another example that's a little more complicated. And we find a church where there is a man involved in sexual, uh, sexual relationship that even astounds unbelieving people. And in the story we find, Paul says, this is the kind even pagans are shocked by. And Paul says, you're putting up with it. You're kind of bragging about it. And then Paul says, but shouldn't you have gone into mourning and put the man out of your fellowship, the man who's doing this? Should you not have said, okay, you're choosing to do this. You're involved in doing this. So here's the truth. Here's reality, Paul would say. We need to ask this man to leave our church. Now, you might think, well, that's horrible. Is there any, any kindness in that at all? I mean, how in the world would that be kind? Well, look as Paul continues he says, so when you're assembled and the power of the Lord Jesus is there, you hand the man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. We'll talk about that a little more another time. So that his spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. And what Paul is saying is this, out of truth, this man is really involved in something bad. And out of kindness, we are asking him to, to leave, step out of our church. Why? Why was Paul writing that? Because this guy really may not be saved. Now, notice Paul doesn't even address the woman because um, she was not a believer and, and there was no need to address her. But Paul was focused on this one guy saying, this guy would tell you, oh, I'm truly saved. I belong to God. Christ lives in me. Paul's not saying he's not. What Paul is saying, this guy might need to go back and revisit to see if he really was in the first place. You might think, well, would a good God share something like that? Would a good God really believe that? Well, here's what Jesus said. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit and every bad tree bears bad fruit. And if you didn't understand that, Jesus would say a good tree cannot bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear 
good fruit. In other words, Jesus was saying this, you might claim to have had an experience with God. You might claim to to know him personally and, and belong to him, but the fruit of your life is what gives the verdict. That is what we can understand is the truth. That's the reality. You might think, well, but, but my experience was I, I had this moment as a child or a teenager or a young adult. And Jesus would come back and say, well, that might or might not be what really happened. But the reality is as we look at the evidence in your life, we see evidence of Christ, evidence of God, or we don't. That's the reality part. And you might think, well, why would that be kind? Well, think about it for a minute. If you're helping someone who thinks they're going to heaven when they die, and it turns out they're really not, and they realize it, that might be the most kindest uh, thing anyone could ever do. So as you think about your relationships, and we set ourselves up for the definition which we're going to look at next week, I'd like to to finish with, with this. So before you say, I love you, or before you might accept someone else saying, I love you, I think you need to ask these questions. Is my love durable or is it purely based on my response to the other person? In other words, is it it originating in me or my response to them? Durability is when it originates with me. Response to them makes it basically kind of a very emotional thing. The second one, is my love based in, in humility or is it really just about me? In other words, is my love about them or is it about me? And then the third tension, or the third one was the tension that we saw, and it is this, can I embrace a tension in my relationship with this person between truth, reality, and kindness? So as we look at these three descriptions, the, actually the two descriptions of the tension, that out of that we can come to the conclusion of whether or not we can actually look at someone and say, I do love you, or accept their love as well. And so for a moment, as you think about God, as you think about Christ, as you answer the first one, God loved us and sent his son. It was not in response to our response or love to him. It was something he took the initiative in doing. And the second part, Jesus willingly gave up heaven and came to earth and lived with you and me and died on a cross and was raised again. The ultimate statement of humility. And he always comes to us with reality, with truth, and at the same time, always in kindness because he really does love us. Wow, is God's love so amazing. And I pray you've experienced it yourself. I know I have. And as we think about our relationships and those two descriptions in that tension, how radical that can change the way we interact with family, with friends, with God, and with just about anybody that we claim to love. So Father, we are thankful for your love for us. We're thankful that it is durable. We're thankful that it is full of humility that your son willingly came and died and that God, you always operate in, in that tension between truth and kindness, that you want us to live in reality and yet at the same time, you want us to know of your goodness and your grace. And Father, help us to look at our relationships, all of them, through the lenses we've seen this morning, or today, the descriptions that we've seen in the tension as well. And God, we do, we are so overwhelmed, amazed by your love. And as we prepare to look at the definitions next week, help us throughout this week to think about the descriptions we've seen and the tension we have to embrace. In your son's name we pray, amen. So I'd like to invite you. Maybe something that was shared in the message really spoke to you. Maybe you'd like to take a spiritual step or have a prayer request. Two ways you can, first of all, you can email me here at this web at this address, or if you'd like to drop a note in the mail, you can do it here in Rinkin, Georgia. And I would love to follow up with you and, and hear from you and be a part of your experience with God himself. Thanks for, for, uh, for being with us today. And we look forward to talking with you next week.